Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us to Stay Curious. And joining our Stay Curious program from the Asheville, North Carolina area is Mark Goodkind. Greetings, Mark. How are you? Hey, how are you doing? Well, we're good. We're so blessed that you can talk with us here. Uh, Mark Goodkind has got some great stories to tell us about the Gemini program. 56 years ago tomorrow, he was the launch uh, uh Test conductor wrote the manual for the launch of this important mission that we had two Geminis in space at the same time. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then he also was an important member of the Apollo and uh, Grumman crew. And of course, we have with us uh, Mark uh, uh, Marty Winkle, my cameraman, co-producer, and Jessica Galloway. We are outside the box today, Mark Goodkind, trying to do some. Uh, some of our Stay Curious programs that we've been doing for over a year and, and almost two years in March. So we're glad that you're with us. How's everything in the Asheville area? It's beautiful. Uh, we just love it up here. Well, of course, I tell everyone I'm familiar with that area, having lived in the Tri-Cities, Bristol, Kingsport, and Johnson City for 35 years. And uh, I love the Smoky Mountains, but the Blue Ridge Mountains are, are something else too, aren't they? Oh, they're beautiful. And I've done a lot of stargazing up there around Mount Mitchell and dark places like that. Over it's, the top of my head here, uh, we're showing our beautiful background on our green screen is a photograph that either Jim Lovell or Frank Borman took on their uh, Gemini 7 14-day mission that was, uh, 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 and this is the, the moon rising overhead. And Mark, uh, good kind, this is appropriate because... 49 years ago today, Apollo 17 lifted off the moon a little after 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time to end our moon mission and the race with Russia to the moon. Right. Uh, what do you think about that, it, uh, the juxtaposition of time here? Well, um, it's interesting that the program ended then. Um, I don't think anybody wanted it to end. There was a lot more we could have done. Um but it's interesting that those anniversaries are juxtaposed. It is. And we're going to start off our little Stay Curious program by thanking the Marie Louise G. West Endowment for allowing us to buy the equipment needed to do this. Uh, Marcus, we are a proud nonprofit here in the delivery room of America's Space Age, Brevard County, Florida. And people like uh, the Marie Louise G. West Endowment are people that keep our doors open. And because Stay Curious has become somewhat of a uh, a monster in the fact uh, in the fact that we didn't intend it to be a daily uh, podcast like it is, uh, we're grateful to the, the endowments like from the Marie Louise G. West Endowment for that. And uh, uh, you understand how important that is, I'm sure. Uh, but Marcus Goodkind, he likes to be called Mark. He's coming to us from Arden, North Carolina, outside of Asheville. Sir, tell us a little bit about where you grew up, your education, and how you got into the space business. Okay. Uh, I was born and raised in Miami Beach, in South Beach, actually, um, down at the very south end of Miami Beach. And um, I went to high school there. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my high school because they just recently, well, I guess it's been seven years ago now, uh, I was inducted into their Hall of Fame. And um, so anyway, I, I went to high school there and then I went to the University of Miami uh, with a four-year scholarship. And I majored in industrial engineering. Uh, I majored in industrial engineering because um, it prepared me to go into management. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated, and I was also in, in Air Force ROTC there. So when I graduated, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant. And shortly after that, I went to flight school. Uh, I went to flight school in uh, first in Bainbridge, Georgia, and then in San Angelo, Texas, and then finally in Wichita, Kansas to learn to fly B-47s. Hmm. That's interesting. So, uh, my sister lives in St. Angelo. Got to say hi to my really? sister and my niece there. Yeah, I've been there many, many times. Okay. And by the way, we've got the picture of you you sent, of you being a young man with your hard hat on, 
Uh, at which pad are you at there? We're jumping ahead there, but you, I just want to let you know. Pad 19. Pad 19 there. So I yeah. uh, want to let you know that was up because he can't see the pictures we're projecting there. Okay. So uh, continue there, Marcus. All right. So um, once, um, uh, once I threw, was through flight training, I went to McDill Air Force Base in Tampa, and that's where I spent the rest of my time in, in the Air Force. It was about that time that my first child was born, uh, Brian. And then um, after that, I went back to Baltimore to work for the Martin Company. Uh, and uh, I was soon assigned to the MACE program, which was being tested in Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. Uh, shortly after that, uh, we had to move the program to the Cape because there wasn't enough range in, in New Mexico. We needed a thousand miles and you can't get that on the States. So we moved to the Cape and uh, at that point we were launching uh, the MACE, which was the, one of the first cruise missiles. We were launching it from behind sandbags. So shortly after that, um, the hard site was built on, it was then pad 21. And uh, then we started launching them out of the, uh, out of the hard site. This is uh, what, uh, what year is this? Tell people. 1959, 1960. Thank you. Okay. A very exciting thing happened to me there. I was the, the launch test supervisor and I, um, uh, we tried to launch the MACE. The, race, the MACE had a, a solid rocket booster. And um, so we sent the firing signal and nothing happened. So somebody had to go out to the pad and see what happened. And so I, I volunteered like, like a young fool. <laughs> okay. I went out and saw that the umbilical had come loose uh, from, from the uh, solid rocket booster. So I talked to the to uh, the guys in the in the in the launch center, and I said, uh, well, "What do you think I ought to do?" And they said, "Well, I guess you ought to hook it back up." <laughs> and so I was thinking, "Well, that's easy for you to say." <laughs> really? So I hooked it back up, and I heard this loud click, <laughs> and uh, um, it scared me out of my wits. <laughs> really? You didn't know if it was going to take off? What, what what the click was was the the booster going into the to the safe position. Uh -huh. So then uh, after MACE, um, I was uh, asked to join a, uh, a special program called the Missile Management Training Program. And uh, they brought in three people from outside the company. And I, I was the only one from inside the company. So I was in that program for about nine months. And then I was assigned to the Gemini program, which was in its infancy. We, I mean, at that point, we were still writing procedures and building the uh, building pad 19. So one of my first assignments was as a mission monitor. And what that involved was um, sitting in mission control, uh, which at, the, at that time was at the Cape. And then one of my other assignments was to monitor the Mercury program to make sure we didn't make the same mistakes they did or uh, that we did things we did things right the way they were doing them. And I happened to be in the blockhouse um, on pad, I guess it was 14 or 15, when John Glenn went up. Mm -hmm. 14. And I remember hearing on the headset, Godspeed, John Glenn. Hmm. So then, uh, then uh, Gemini was getting ready to, to start launching. The first two were unmanned. And then Gemini 3 was the first manned one that was Gus's. Um, and uh, so I, I wrote about this later. When I, I talked to Gus afterwards, he said that <clears throat> he had named, uh, I mean, th that, that capsule that he was in when he got out of it, 
it sunk. And so, um, uh, so the next time he flew on Gemini, I'm talking about when, when he flew on Mercury. Yeah, MA4, yes. Yeah, that, that, that one sunk. Or MR4, so the, Mercury Redstone 4, yeah. Right. So the next time he flew on Gemini 3, he named the capsule Molly Brown mm -hmm. because it was supposed to be the unsinkable Molly Brown. And so it didn't sink. <laughs> now, uh, tell us, you had a very special relationship with Gus Grissom. Tell us yes. where that started, and, and we'll, we'll, of course, share some of that. Okay. In the early part of the Gemini program, one of my assignments was to write and coordinate with the crew abort procedures. So, so, uh, Okay. Yeah, everything's okay. okay. So, that, so I, I attended a lot of meetings with the astronauts, um, and one of them that was always there was Gus, and so he and I got to be pretty good friends. So that was early on in the Gemini program. There you are. In fact, I put up the picture of you on the far right with Gus and uh, uh, Cooper. Gordon Cooper. Gordo was my favorite one for a long time. And there's another yeah. gentleman between the two of them there. And uh, I always thought it was cool. They're always, you know, these are test pilots used to wearing jumpsuits and all, but they always dressed up. They always had the white shirt and the thin tie uh, yeah. to represent NASA, I guess. Well, there's a polo shirt with uh, Cooper on there. But uh, and, and we just wanted to back up here. We, we cruised by a picture of you at the 50th reunion with uh, our emeritus board member, uh, Fredo, Mr. Fred Hayes. Yeah. And uh, we're always happy to show Fred. Uh, he's a good friend of uh, of your friend, uh, Charlie uh, Mars. Oh, yeah. And hello, Charlie. There's your two buddies there. Of course, Charlie, I lovingly call the godfather of our museum here. Right. And uh, we're so happy that he hooked up. This uh, conversation with Marcus Goodkind, who is an Apollo or Gemini, Apollo and Skylab test and operations manager. He's got some more great stories to tell us here. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we wanted, wanted to show the picture of the astronauts there. Uh, so you got to know Gus pretty well. And we'll go back to that here in just a minute. Okay. Uh, because I uh, kind of wanted to end that with uh, your relationship with Gus. But tell us a little bit about this uh uh, mission of uh, Gemini 7 launched before Gemini 6, okay. 56 years ago today. All right. So uh, the Gemini 6 countdown, um, that, that started first. So we got to T0 and the engine started, but then it immediately shut down. So this was, uh, we, I mean, we had a procedure for this. So we started through the procedure, but, um, you know, things never quite go the way you think they're going to go. And it turned out that we had a, uh, one of the drain lines, the fuel drain lines had come off and there was a fire in the boat tail uh, in, the, in the engine compartment. So we were talking to the crew, um, <laughs> I think the, the crew and us guys on the ground were trying to keep each other calm <laughs> because this was kind of an, a, a dangerous, possibly explosive situation. And as, as you and I have talked before, um, if, if they would have had to eject, which was the way that they, they would normally get out of a capsule in an emergency, mm -hmm. They may not have survived that because um, the, the ejection seats might not have gotten them far enough away from a blast. And also, uh, as, you, as you indicated, they were in 100% oxygen and probably would have burned off. up. Yeah. We wanted to back up uh, the, uh, the, the, the way history lays out itself here. And uh, Mark Goodkind was there to to see it. Was Gemini Six was supposed to launch, uh, let's say, in June or July, and the Agena rocket didn't make it to space. So they right. decided to wait 
Gemini 7 was going to be a 14-day mission with Jim Lovell and Frank Borman, and they launched GT7 ahead of 6. And then the when you tried, and here I have a picture of GT7 I'm showing, the nice slender two-engine uh, Titan two rocket that um, uh, General Tom Stafford told me rode like a sports car is what the general said about that. And then you here I'm showing your master countdown list that they dubbed. They decided, well, we got Gemini 7 up there already. We got Gemini 6 figured out. Let's launch at the same time and rendezvous with them. And here is your master countdown list that you wrote with all four astronauts have autographed that. All right. And then when you launch GT6, I mean, I'm sorry, GT6 uh, uh, on December 12th, I think it was, that's when you had the abort, which, folks, that was one of the scariest things. They'd never really rehearsed this, particularly the ejection seats, uh, what a cool, calm, collected Wally Shira was not to pull the D-ring, and, and uh, the, the forces of them being ejected out of here May, may have busted all kinds of arteries and veins in their bodies. But then finally we got off on December 15th, 56 years ago, and I'm backing up here to your manual of the 76 with the fife and drum corps there. Now I'm going to turn it over to you as I set that stage there about, about putting all that together, Mark. Okay, so we as you said, we decided to launch – Gemini 7 first, because it was a 14-day mission. So once we did that, we had to then clean up the pad. We had to then erect Gemini 6, which had already been checked out. So we wrote an abbreviated checkout procedure for Gemini 6. And then um, while Gemini 7 was still up there, we launched Gemini 6. And uh, I have a picture behind me of um, Gemini 6 taken from Gemini 7, uh, signed by uh, Tom Stafford. And um, do you so, now? That's nice. That's pretty sweet. So that was the first time that we had ever uh, rendezvoused two manned spacecraft. It was the first time we ever had four astronauts in space at the same time. And so it was, it was a real milestone for the program and for the country. Let me say something about your responsibility there that you wrote me in a little, little bit here. Uh, you said that uh, writing the procedures for this uh, was, quote, an awesome responsibility. The documents I was working on could mean life or death for astronauts if something went wrong with the Gemini launch vehicle. Spaceflight is very risky and dangerous. But as test pilots, these guys are used to living on the edge. Comment a little about that. Okay, well, as I indicated a little earlier, um, one of my responsibilities was to write and review abort procedures. So that's what I was referring to in that paragraph, that uh, the abort procedures had to be um, very accurate and detailed because the astronauts' lives depended on it. Uh, fortunately, we never had to use abort procedures. But one of the things that uh, was included in the master countdown that you just referred to was the procedure for what happens if a vehicle shuts down on a pad. Mm -hmm. Why didn't Shara eject? Uh, I don't know. I never asked him. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, he's written in his biographies that he didn't feel anything in his butt. He he had a Mercury flight, and he knew the feeling of of liftoff, and uh, uh, and so he didn't pull that D ring that was uh, just jet ejection seats. They're supposed to get him at least eight hundred feet away. Had they done that, the uh, the rocket may have fell over. I understand from the force of those ejection seats. Would the Titan two have just toppled over and blown up on the pad? Well, if the launch bolts had fired, it, it might have. Mm -hmm. But in, in that particular case, the launch bolts never fired. Okay. Actually, the SRO called me and asked me, because I have a recording of that, 
um, which I will donate to the museum, by the way. Oh, that's awesome. We are um, uh, love to have the, that. The SRO, the state, the range safety officer called me and said, did the launch bolts fire? Because he didn't know whether we were flying or whether, you know, he didn't know what the situation was. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, the launch bolts did not fire. Okay. So they were firmly on the pad, and that's a good thing to know. Yeah. We want to go to the, from that wonderful mission 56 years ago. We'll put it up on Facebook. Uh, the, 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 the 14 days in a, in a vehicle, two grown men sitting side by side. I think a, a Volkswagen Beetle had more room in the front of it than uh, these two guys had. It was truly an amazing thing. Uh, they were recommended to take up a couple books to read, if you can imagine that. And uh, we're looking at the picture, kind of an unusual picture of GT7 from 6. And, and uh, when you saw the pictures back from Earth, they had all these straps from uh, the connecting and so forth off the service module there. That had to have been surprising to see, Mark, was it? Yeah. 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 Though, there were a lot of wires hanging out. But, um, that was pretty. Yeah, we, we, we kind of expected that. We can see it in this picture. But you were, uh, and to talk about the, I, want, I have now the picture of the master countdown for uh, uh, Gemini Titan 12, signed by uh, Jim Lovell and Buzz Aldrin. And if you all are looking at this on my screen, you see the name approval on the far left-hand corner. You're the first one there, uh, uh, Mark Goodkind, to approve uh, that manual there, launch there. Uh, and to... To, before I turn you loose on this, I want our readers, our, our, our people out there to stay curious to know that uh, these missions of Gemini in 1965 and 66, I think, gave us everything we needed to go to the moon. And we probably would have done it in 1968 had it not been for the Apollo 1 fire. But Marcus, let people know what a, what a task this was. Ten missions in two years every other month they were launching a gemini mission to prove one we could live live the, the time and space it took to go to the moon and back at least eight days three days there and three days back we had to have a space suit to walk on the moon and then we had to figure out rendezvous and docking and that was the goals of this and they met all these goals and what i find fascinating in the moon race with russia is russia did not fly one crude one man flight during this period uh, when we were certainly putting our uh, our stamp on on our knowledge to go to the moon. So comment about the whole program and how dynamic that was for two years. Okay, the Gemini program was my favorite. Um, you know, on all the programs I worked on, Gemini was my most favorite because we were a very close knit bunch of guys. Um, we we and the astronauts were all good friends. And um, I had a lot more contact with them in the Gemini program than I did in Apollo because Apollo was so big, so many people involved. So um, we actually worked, um, I was with the Martin Company at that time, and we actually worked for the Air Force uh, because the Air Force um, owned the booster. The, the, the Gemini launch vehicle was a converted Titan II. Uh, it was, it was uh, upgraded to be man-rated. And so there were a lot of redundant systems added to it um, to make it safe to carry astronauts. So um, you're, you're right. It was, um, it was very intense because we launched every other month. And so it was... Um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, actually my shift started at 2.48 in the morning and oh, ran, wow. ran till three o'clock in the afternoon. Huh. Really? And, yeah, yeah, they were back to back 12 hour shifts. Hmm. For, for, for things to happen uh, and, and, and take off, uh, uh, the challenge of seeing by 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 G by this these missions GT seven and six, did you have some sort of satisfaction that that everything was really going in the right direction that you were learning how to put humans in space? Was it kind of becoming routine? Well, space flight's never routine, 
And, you know, I don't think we ever looked at it that way. But we also never really thought that um, anything was going to go really bad. Um, and the, what I described about the Gemini 6 shutdown was about the worst thing that ever happened on the program. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, you could say we were lucky. You could say that we were well prepared. But in any case, um, we, we got it done. And uh, at the time, I don't think that, <clears throat> that we realized um, what our contribution was. You know, the fact that you just said what, what, the, what the mission was supposed to prove, rendezvous, and, and all those other things you said, I don't think we understood uh, at the time that we were preparing to put men on the moon. I mean, we knew that's what we were working toward mm -hmm. uh, because we were so en engrossed in it. I don't think that that we really stopped to think about that. Yeah, if we didn't accomplish that, then the moon mission could never happen. Well, it was an exciting time for this uh, teenager to be experiencing it. Uh... <laughs> Uh, and, you know, to keep up with it in the 60s, I talked to people in our museum. I said, what was the Twitter of the day? How would you have known that uh, Ed White was about to do his spacewalk uh, back in 1965? Well, that'd be the AM radio because at the top and bottom of the hour, they had news and they'd break in during the time. But AM radio is definitely your Twitter of the day, meaning your most up-to-the-date knowledge, of course, of what was going on. We're talking with Marcus Goodkind, who, as you see there, uh, had an extensive career as a contractor, first with Martin Marietta and the Gemini program. And then he got involved with the Apollo program. Before I segue to that, uh, Marcus, we've got a comment, Jessica. Uh, Catherine O'Connor. Catherine Connor. Connor. Catherine Connor. Hi. On. Uh, thanks for watching. Yep. It said V A S F dot tech. V A S F dot. I didn't see when it came in, so I don't know what. Okay. It was in well. To, but, uh, don't, give us another comment. Yeah. Don't understand that com, but we appreciate people on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch, which is a social media for gamers. Uh, there, Marcus, are watching us here. This. Uh, uh, oral history conversation made possible by the Marie Louise G. West Endowment. We're so grateful for them buying the equipment that we needed to do these uh, more broadcasts we're going to do. Uh, Marcus Goodkind is in his home in Arden, South Car North Carolina, near Asheville in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And uh, Marcus, I just, I'm putting up here a photograph of the GT-12 Prime crew with their backup crew standing in the goal wings of the uh, Gemini wasn't designed to carry four people, but you got Gene Cernan and um, Gordon Cooper were the backup for this mission. And uh, it's a good picture to show them. You may remember it. They're in their their, their blue flight suits uh, standing with cameras and so forth. To give people the idea of this was a very small vehicle, uh, the gull wings on it, uh, we never came back to those. Uh, uh, this was also going to be the main uh, spacecraft for the manned orbiting laboratory mission that never happened. So, uh, any comments to put the button on Gemini there, Marcus, and your great contribution to it? Well, um, I was I was very fortunate to uh, to be the the test launch conductor for Gemini Seven and Gem Gemini Six. Um, uh, I, w I was interviewed by the uh, Today paper, and uh, so they they said, "Well, what did what did what did you think about the Gemini program?" And I said, "Well, I think it was our greatest achievement." But when they put it in the paper, they said it was my greatest achievement, and so the guys in the pad never let me forget that I said it was mine. But that's <laughs> not what I said. I said it was ours. So um, that's one of the funny things I remember about the program. The, the other thing I remember is that during that program, uh, I had twin boys that were born. Oh. And so 
So one of the articles in the paper asked me, how come you didn't name them Castor and Pollux? Right, yeah, really, the Gemini twins. Uh, well, right. that's, and because they would hate you forever for that. <laughs> yeah, Probably. but their names are Scott and Marty. Scott and Marty, okay. Yeah. Well, that reminds me, Marty Winkles here worked on as an electrical engineer on those uh, wonderful Grumman lunar modules we're going to talk about here in a minute. And Jessica Galloway is running the board here as we do a Stay Curious program with a remote guest, Mr. Marcus Goodkind. He is in North uh, Carolina, a beautiful area of our, our world there in the Asheville area there. Uh, we want to segue into... Uh, and I'm going to back up the pictures here to put it on Gus uh, in the control room there. So you can talk about your good friend at this time, Gus Grissom, who uh, is why you got involved in the um, uh, Apollo program. And I wanted to just mention something that you wrote me here, that uh, you had a lot of time with Gus, and you said he was different from the other Mercury 7 astronauts not being the gung-ho type as most test pilots were. Rather, he was quiet, seriously serious, and unassuming, and with a great sense of humor. These were qualities that I admired. I knew many of those seven and some of the astronauts who followed, but only close to a few, and in my mind, Gus was unique. He had a similar disposition to Neil Armstrong. So tell us about how uh, you, uh, you crashed on the moon uh, with Gus and how that all played into you uh, ended up working for Grumman. Okay. At the end of the Gemini program, um, I didn't really know where I was going because um, Martin really had nothing else going at the Cape. And so they were talking about sending me to, to Vandenberg, California, to work on the Titan III program. I was not thrilled about doing that. I, did, I love Florida and I didn't particularly want to leave. My family didn't want to leave. So, um, so I was trying to figure out what to do and Gus called me and asked me to come join him across the river uh, in the flight simulator building uh, where there was a lunar module mock-up simulator. So I went over there and he let me fly the simulator a couple of times. And as you said, I crashed on the moon. <laughs> and so he said, well, that's not so bad. You know, he said it took me a year to get used to this. So, um, so then he said, I, I want to talk to you. He said, um, uh, I believe this is Gus talking. He, he says, I believe that the Apollo program is a mess. And we need some really good talent over here to straighten it out. So he said, um, would you consider coming over on the Apollo program? <clears throat> and I said, well, Gus, uh, I have 12 years with Martin. I would have to give that up. And um, he said, well, um, think about it. And, you know, whatever you decide, I would really appreciate you considering this. So I went home, talked it over with the family and none of the family wanted to leave Florida. They said, well, you got to do something. You got to get on Apollo somehow. So uh, I said, well, okay, I'll think about it. Well, about two weeks later, um, I was driving home uh, in our Volkswagen Beetle. I just picked up my son from Cub Scouts and we were listening to one of those AM radio stations that you referred to, and they said um, they broke in with a bulletin that says there's been a fire on pad 34, and I knew that's where Gus was that night, um, but uh, they didn't identify right away that the fire was in the capsule. It just said there was a fire, but um, as I went home and listened to more, um, then they said, uh, yeah, there was a fire in the capsule, and they don't believe that the three astronauts survived. Well, um, <clears throat> so at that point, um, I, I said to my wife, well, wow, you know, the last thing that Gus said to me was, you know, consider coming on to Apollo. So um, I guess 
it was later that night or one night later on, uh, I went outside and just to be by myself and to think about things. And I looked up in the moon and, you know, in my imagination, I could see Gus up there looking back at me. And so I said to myself, well, I can't not do this. I, I, I have to find a way to get on the Apollo program. So I went to my supervisor at Martin. He says, well, um, George Skirl is my next door neighbor. Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm sure, sure he'd love to have you on the, the Lunar Module program. So he did talk to George and George called me and, and asked me to come interview and I did and make a long story short, they, uh, they hired me on as an assistant spacecraft test manager. And I had that job on the first couple unmanned launches. And then for, uh, again, I was very fortunate just as I was on Gemini seven and six I was very fortunate to get the job of spacecraft manager on Apollo 11. Wow. Wanted to mention to our Stay Curious of watchers there on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch that George Skirla was the uh, top manager here at Kennedy Space Center for all of the 1,500 Grumman employees. And uh, in fact, he is uh, honored at the Florida uh, Institute of Technology down the road in Melbourne with a building named after him. And, and his son uh, has been on our Stay Curious programs before, Marcus. So... Uh, the Skirla name is well known here at the American Space Museum, thanks to Marty Winkle and all his Grummies that that we've enjoyed uh, uh, participating in our show here. Uh, wanted to put up here the picture. Uh, we'll go through these pictures again there. Uh, the GT abort, your master countdown list. Uh, here is a, a pretty interesting keepsake. You've got the Apollo 11 crew signed uh is that a photograph or a lithograph they signed for you? It's um, uh, those are actual signatures. That picture was given to me by a Secret Service agent who was with the Apollo crew as they toured the world after uh, after Apollo Eleven. He was with them, and they signed that picture and gave it to him, and he gave it to me just before he passed away. Wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, we've got a picture of you here at uh, the Smithsonian with the Apollo uh, uh, lunar test uh, article is what I think is the uh, display there. Am I right, Marcus? Do you remember? Yes. Or? Yeah, that's uh, that's um, that is actually uh, a real lunar module. Mm -hmm. It was one of the ones that didn't fly, obviously. Um, and I actually, um, if you'll notice the gold foil in the picture, mm -hmm. sure uh, do. up on the wall behind me, I have a piece of foil, a piece of gold foil from Apollo 11. Well, that's, uh, that is very cool. All right. And it looks like you got some nice awards and, and other things up on your little wall of fame up there, Mark. Right. Um, anything mean, real important to you up there that, uh more than any of the others? Well, I have a picture of Gus that's important to me. And- um, I'll bet it well, is. I, I also have a, uh, I, I didn't send you this picture, but I have a picture that Charlie gave me. Uh, Charlie was famous for doodling during, during uh, meetings. Charlie Mars, our Charlie godfather Mars. here, yes. Right. And so he, uh, he, doodled, he doodled a picture one time uh, and it says, um, uh, in honor of the Wright brothers, and it, it, it shows um, a, a picture of, um, of, it's a caricature of the first plane that they flew. Can you, uh, is, are you able to show it to us on the, on the picture? Well, let me see if I can turn it around. Yeah, yeah, turn around there and show it on there. Oh, there you got all. I'm sure Charlie will get a kick out of this, and... Uh, we're going to can you see that at the bottom uh let's see no oh there there is frame there a little wright brothers uh yeah wright, wright brothers built around the uh command module or something huh 
yeah, it's it, yeah. There it, we see it, it there. Yeah, it's hard for me to do this okay. because I can't. Yeah, can't really see it very well. There you go. We got a big old red circle around. Thank you for trying there. Yep, that's Charlie Mars's yep. artwork there. Wow. Okay. That'll be that'll be worth a small fortune in an auction yeah, someday. Probably. For, yeah, probably. Yeah, he. Uh, uh, we we autographed off his uh, his. Uh, I guess I can say this dumb shit award. You remember that? Yes. Yes, the DS award where he did the not. DS award. Oh yeah. He called a big meeting with astronauts and then forgot about it and didn't show up. And all the astronauts signed this DS award uh, uh, to him. And uh, I absolutely need uh, to see that. We uh, yes, we. Uh, anyway, we 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 love everybody on Stay Curious watching our program here. We have people uh, uh, in uh, Scotland, New Zealand, Paris. Uh, Saudi Arabia, all kinds of people around the world, China, and uh, watching us here on Stay Curious, Marcus. And we're so great. We're so appreciative that you spent your time to share with you a little bit about the uh, uh, your contribution uh, to America's space program. We take it seriously here by calling you a national treasure. You did things. I mean, you know, y your procedure manuals were obviously copied through other programs. All right. And uh, but tell us a little bit about the Apollo 11, your responsibilities for Apollo 11 and then Apollo 13. OK, the responsibilities of the spacecraft test manager was to test the vehicle on the ground, uh, put it through all kinds of, of, of activities and tests to make sure that it was going to operate when it gets to the moon. And that included putting it in a vacuum chamber uh, and um, just running it through uh, all kinds of procedures um, to check everything and all the redundant systems to make sure that everything would work. So once the launch took place, um, our job, my job and my crew's job was done. It was over. And so um, it was it was a, a lot of responsibility. And uh, I had a really good crew who worked hard, long, long and hard. And uh, a lot of the credit for Apollo 11 goes to them. You were over 300 people, you said. Yeah. In there. Uh, and then how about your role with Apollo 13? It was uh, pretty much the same. Uh, I worked with um, another spacecraft manager on Apollo 13. His name was John Adamoli. Um, he has since passed away. But John and I worked together uh, on Apollo 13. So uh, when that accident happened, how confident were you in the Grumman Lunar Module as a lifeboat for these the famous story, of course, we all know. Well, um, yeah, the story is very accurate. Um, and the reason I say that is because I know who wrote the book, uh, Jim Lovell. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk uh, about was, the Apollo 13 movie also. The Apollo 13 very... book and movie, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how confident were we that that was going to happen? Um, I think it was... It, our confidence was about 50-50 because it had never been designed to do this. Um, so um, Houston and the astronauts uh, and with, with support from the people uh, at KSC uh, were making it up as they went along. Mm -hmm. So um, it, was, it was dicey. It was definitely dicey. You often knew Fred y'all obviously know Fred Hayes. Uh, uh, he he left the Apollo uh, program to become uh, vice president of uh, uh, Grumman. Uh, I'm trying to put a picture of you and Fred up, Fredo up there for people to see. There you are. There's you and Fredo at the 50th anniversary there at the Astronaut Memorial Foundation. Marty Winkle said he probably he remembers that picture being made of you two together there. I was there also. Quite a gathering that was. Yes, it was. Yes, that was. It was wonderful to 
be with all those folks again. And Marcus, they're trying to, of course, they've been delayed by the pandemic, but January 29th, they are going to celebrate the 50th or 52nd anniversary of uh, Apollo 13. Uh, Fred uh, tends to be there. Uh, Marty, can our, are there still tickets for sale for that? Uh, uh, January, the, our Stay Curious listeners, if you want to come and attend what might be the final gathering of the... It's not open to the listeners. Oh, it's not open to the listeners. Okay, it's Grumman people only. All right, that's... Grumman and Northrop. You Grumman and Northrop Grumman. And this museum. And this museum. You're invited to... Uh, uh, and maybe a stay curious person we could sneak in there, Marty. You're in charge of it, after all. It's 150 bucks and... Uh, uh, $125 on January 29th, which is the evening... We're going to celebrate the astronaut memorial of the Challenger, Apollo 1, and, and, and Columbia astronauts uh, that uh, Saturday morning at Sandpoint Park. So I uh, wanted to assure you, Marcus, this museum does honor the, not, uh, all of our astronauts, but particularly uh, we let the public know about the tragedies of Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia. And one message that we carry, Marcus, is that they all rose out of the ashes and and uh, uh, continued space exploration at its highest level. And how do you feel about that? Just well, um, I, I've always felt like it was a great honor to be part of the space program. Um, people ask me, um, well, how did you get in that position or how did you get there? And my answer is always, uh, I was at the right place at the right time. Um, but uh, I, I was not just lucky, but I was honored to, to serve our country that way. And um, I, I, I wish I wasn't as old as I am or I would be in, space, in the space program right now. Well, I think a lot of you feel like that. Uh, you know, you said here, it wrote me a little piece here that you said, Gus and I were part of the U.S. effort along with thousands of others in a space race to beat the Soviets to the moon by achieving the seemingly impossible feat of President John F. Kennedy's national goal of landing men on the moon and returning them safely to Earth by the end of the decade. And, you know, we did that twice before the end of the decade because Apollo 12 was a double down of that. And then 49 years ago today, we leave the moon for the last time on Apollo 17. Reflect a little bit about this, this five decades of, of, of not returning and, and what a great and difficult achievement it was, Marcus Goodkind. Well, I was very sad when the Apollo program ended. Uh, I was also very sad when we retired the Saturn V because I felt like it, had we continued on um, and used the technology on Apollo 5, I mean, uh, on Saturn 5, we, we might have been far ahead of where we were. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything about the shuttle program, um, except that um, that was a technology that we had to start over from scratch and we had a perfectly good uh, booster in Saturn V that could have accomplished a lot of things that, um, that I, I think we could have done sooner. But um, at any rate, as I said, I was very honored to be part of, of those programs. And um, it was a way that I could give back to my country as and my country has given so much to me and my family. Well, that is awesome that you feel that way, uh, though it was kind of not maybe anticlimactic, but just as important. Uh, Marcus Goodkind went on to be an operations manager for the Skylab program, and then you were operations manager for the external tank, uh, the, the big fuel tank in the shuttle program. So tell us a little about your Skylab and shuttle uh, work. Okay, on Skylab, um, I was the operations manager for the experiments on Skylab, the ones that Martin built. And um, so uh, 
we were involved in all, all four of the launches of Skylab. And then um, for the external tank, um, I left that program early before the first launch. And um, looking back on that, um, I, I remember having a discussion with um, some of my, um, my peers at the time that I didn't feel the shuttle program was safe and that I didn't want to lose any more of my friends. And that's one of the reasons that I left the program. Hmm. Very interesting there. Well, winding up our conversation here with Marcus Goodkind, uh, we're doing it by uh, Google Meets. Uh, thanks to Jessica Galloway, our Trekkie Techies, uh, gone through all the hoops for that today. Uh, Marty Winkle's there, cameraman, and also on the uh, uh, headphones there. Marty was a lunar module Grumman electrical engineer, and then Marty went on to work on the launch uh, process services of the, of the shuttle engines uh, for 30 years there, uh, Marcus. Uh, but one, being a newspaper person and uh, uh, a media person most of my life, I like this little note that you were a technical consultant to ABC News' uh, famous Jules Bergman. Jules Bergman, the equivalent of Walter Cronkite on CBS, and, and uh, who was the NBC guy? Um, I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. I can see his his face. But tell us about the the great Jules Bergman and dealing with him and how you consulted with him, Marcus. Okay, Jules and I became good friends on the Gemini program, and so um, he would add, he would call me and ask me, "Well, tell me about this or tell me about that." And so um, I had to get permission from the company. To, to talk to him. Hmm. And so um, the Martin Company very graciously gave me that permission. And so uh, my job with Jules was to take technical jargon and break it down to what he called eighth grade level. Hmm. <laughs> okay, eighth grade, that, that encompasses most of America can understand that. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I really enjoyed doing that. And so um, uh, uh, not only did um, Martin encourage me to do that, but then when I moved to Grumman, uh, Grumman encouraged me to do that too because they felt like it was good PR for them. And so uh, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of the programs uh, that Jules did, he would often mention the contractor, mm -hmm. either Martin or Grumman. Uh, and so, um, give you a little PR plug there. Yeah. Yeah. The, the companies benefited from it. Um, he benefited from it because there was, there were things that he didn't understand and needed explained to him. Uh, so I would often work with scripts and, um, uh, as he called it, dumb it down. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was pretty much, um, the job that I had with him. And that continued on uh, until I left aerospace in 1982. But then uh, shortly after um, I married my present wife, Caroline, uh, in 1985, I got a call in early 1986 from Jules saying, because uh, I knew that the Challenger had, had um, gone down. And so he called and said, can you come to the Cape and work on the Challenger investigation. So I said, well, sure, you know. Uh, so I did, I, I went down there and uh, I was down there for about four months uh, working with Jules uh, on, the, uh, on the investigation. I got to go to the hearings in Washington. Mm. And um, uh, it, was, it was a very exciting time for me. And a little story that I, I have about that time uh, I noticed when I was coming into, uh, we had a trailer out at the press site. So when I was, and I lived in Titusville. So I was coming, when I was coming in one day, I noticed that the uh, parking lot at the VIC, the visitor center was full of cars, which it hadn't been before Challenger. 
So uh, I went to the producer and I said, you know, we ought to do a story about how, you know, the silver lining from this is that there's another, there's now an interest in space that doesn't seem to have been there before. And he said, Mark, you don't understand. Um, news people are not interested in good news. <laughs> We're only interested in, 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 in reporting things that go wrong. Yeah. So um, they never did that story, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah that is the news that cycle there. Facing fire trucks and crashes and, and uh, people whose lives have gone awry, unfortunately. Uh, what a fascinating gentleman Marcus Goodkind is. I hope you all have enjoyed this wonderful conversation with this national treasure working uh, on the first intercontinental uh, uh, ballistic rockets uh, of the 19, late 50s and then uh, uh, segueing into the Mercury program and Gemini being the launch director, writing the, writing the launch procedures. Uh, so fascinating. I've really enjoyed this, Marcus. Uh, and I just wanted to mention here that, uh, let me back, let me see if I can go this way. Now, let me go this way to get to it there. Uh, I wanted to get to the fact that as a University of Miami graduate, and as we get late in life, there you are with the lunar module. There are perks that come along your way. And Charlie Mars, our, our board of directors chairman and godfather of this museum, wrote this letter uh, to get you inducted into the Miami uh, Hall of uh, University of Miami Hall of Fame down no, there. No, it was actually in the Miami Beach High School. Hall oh, there we are. Yeah, I'm looking at Miami Beach High School Hall of Fame there. So, uh, Tell us about that and your relationship with Charlie Mars. Okay, Charlie was the, um, the project engineer. Um, he, he was the chief project engineer on the lunar module. And so we had a lot of, uh, uh, I had a lot of interfaces with Charlie. I was in a lot of meetings with him uh, almost daily, certainly several times a week. And, um, so we got to know each other pretty well. And um, so he was like my counterpart. Uh, well, not quite my counterpart because he was in engineering. I was in operations. So, um, but, but we had a lot of contact together and became good friends and still are. Uh, he's, he's one of my uh, oldest friends from the, from the space program. He probably wouldn't appreciate be gone, being called old, but he is, <laughs> he is an old friend. Well, and he's, uh, he's, of course, the reason why you're here with us today, sharing this wonderful knowledge that you have of America's space program, as we do here at the American Space Museum, celebrate the birth of the space age right in its delivery room, Brevard County, here in sunny Florida. Uh, Mr. Goodkind, thank you so much for your, 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 your time. I wanted to mention that um, you're a volunteer at many things, uh, like so many active people uh, in their, their careers, in the space career, you give, st you're still giving. I have a note here that you are a volunteer at the First Flight Centennial Center at Kitty Hawk, the Myrtle Beach Airport. Uh, uh, I've been to Myrtle Beach too many times, I think. Uh, and then you are also at the Brook Green Gardens on Murals Inlet and a volunteer at the North Carolina Arboretum. And uh, well, God bless you for giving your time like that. Well, thank you. Um, of course, COVID has affected a lot of that. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I enjoy volunteering and do so whenever I can. Well, we've enjoyed this conversation with you, Marcus Goodkind. Is there anything that you want to share with our Stay Curious listeners that we didn't cover? I think uh, you pretty well covered uh, pretty much everything. Um, I want to um, to thank the Space Museum for for doing a show like this. Um, I've watched some of your other shows, and um, I, I appreciate you asking me being being on, Mark. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Well, I've enjoyed it, and I can't wait to meet you personally. My next trip uh, that's not a holiday trip because I'm coming up to the Tri-Cities 
uh, of course, for Christmas and see some family members. But I look forward to seeing you maybe this spring, sir. We've got a comment, Jessica. We've got uh, Mark Musiak coming through. NBC with Frank McGee, space reporter. Thank you, Mark Musiak. Frank McGee was the reporter for NBC. You remember him, don't you? Yes. Yeah. I can see his face. Thank you, Mark Musiak. We've got two brothers, Tom and Mark, that photographed over 60 shuttle launches, and they share those images with us. Dave Stang on YouTube says, great job as usual, and thanks for sharing your story with us. Dave Stang is one of our viewers up there in Michigan, and he thanks you, Marcus, for your time here. Apparently, a lot of our regulars really enjoy uh, the conversation with you. Uh, it's phenomenal the things that, we, that you know that we even didn't get a chance to get to. So hopefully we can have you back. Maybe your next trip down here to visit Charlie will do, uh, we'll definitely uh, get you in here. On another program, you. you got it. Yeah, uh, and Marty says you can still show up at the Apollo 13 celebration. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, definitely Charlie will be there, and a lot of other people you know. Fredo's supposed to be there. Uh, who are the other astronauts? Charlie Duke, Jack Lausma, and Tom Stafford will be there. Uh, okay. And, uh, but. Uh, uh, like you said, you've been traveling a lot this year, so you got to take good care of your health. So, well, on behalf of the whole museum here, we are so grateful to you taking your time. And I guess uh, in closing, that's what we wish for you is good health for you and your wife. I hope you have a mild uh, uh, winter up there in North Carolina. Uh, uh, I know the snow's fun to have, and it usually melts pretty quick, doesn't it? Yeah. Up there. So, uh, yeah, we don't get a lot of snow. No. So, well, thank you very much. And like I say, on behalf of our museum, uh, Stay Curious is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. We have over 400 episodes loaded up on Facebook for your viewing pleasure. So tell people that this is one they're going to want to see. So share it with your friends out there. Thank you, Marcus Goodkind, for your wonderful insight into America's space program again. And we will come back tomorrow with another Stay Curious program with some astronaut birthdays and history, all to bridge the space between us. Thank you very much. Thank you.